Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News episode recapping the Hardware News for the last week, as you might expect. We're talking Intel Coffee Lake announcements and I don't know what they were, leaks I guess, for the desktop parts. Looking at some AMD driver update news because that came out right after we posted our monitor video and that's got some interesting stuff in it. Liquid cooling, uh, video game info that's actually pretty cool. Final Fantasy's got some recommended specs or uh, requirements out there. So look through all those. We've got a couple other things as well. So all that and more in this week's Hardware News Recap. Before that, we partnered with LastPass to bring you this video. LastPass is a password manager that helps generate random passwords for each account, ensuring unique passwords for every login. LastPass strengthens account security so that you're no longer using the same password for multiple sites. Learn more at the link below. Starting off with Coffee Lake, official news for Coffee Lake largely pertains to the mobile launch, but a partner session in China offered more insight to 8th gen desktop SKUs. Of note, the flagship i7-8700K allegedly bumps up to 6 cores, 12 threads from the usual 4 core, 8 thread component, and carries a base frequency of 3.8 gigahertz boosting to all-core turbo of 4.3. Single-core turbo should reach 4.7 gigahertz, and these numbers are compared to 4.2 base and 4.5 boost on the 7700K. Intel is mostly increasing core count slightly, just enough to be useful in applications that can leverage it, but staying low enough to keep higher frequencies and probably reduce some costs. So it's an interesting strategy in opposition to Ryzen. Cache is also up now. They're at 12 megabytes for L3 cache on the i7 SKUs rather than 8 megabytes of L3 previously. The i5 series is where the most interesting changes are happening. They're going to six cores, six threads. So up by two cores total, two threads, of course, total. That's headed up by the i5-8600K, the new flagship SKU i5 component, and the i5-8400 non-K, both of which have the same cache, the same core count. The 8600K will run a 3.6 gigahertz base clock and will boost to 4.1 all core with one core boost to 4.3 gigahertz. The CPU is also supposed to have nine megabytes of shared L3 cache. And then what we don't know yet is the pricing. So this is this is a, a pretty decent shift for the i5 line, bit of a shift for the i7 line. It's, it's like finally some movement out of Intel. And whether or not this is something that they've planned since before Ryzen, the important thing is, will the price be affected? Because that's, let's just say that they had already planned to release these parts. If they already had this on the plans, what Ryzen would still have effect on is pricing. So we can hope that the competition of the 1700 and the R5 marketplace will drive down costs of these six core and, and, uh, and well, six core and 12 thread parts. So that's what we're hoping for. The other thing is the i3 specs posted by Chiphel. So they showed an i3-8350K, official source from Intel, at four cores, four threads, four gigahertz clock speed, and eight megabytes of L3 cache. And then for the AMD news, there's a driver update for the video cards. So we just posted that monitor video about the CF791, and our conclusion was more or less, this flickering isn't a problem in Vega, it was a problem in Polaris and Fiji. And if you have Vega, then we basically said, it's either, look, it's either a driver thing or it's a chip level thing. And because the issue kind of persisted on Vega FE, we thought it was more likely a driver thing. Well. Looks like there may have been some truth to that assumption. So AMD's version 17.8.1 drivers for the Radeon settings tool just came out and they include, quote, uh, fixes for free sync displays may experience stuttering when watching full screen video content that's been resolved. And free sync of brightness or flickering issues have been resolved on a small amount of Samsung free sync enabled displays that may have been experiencing issues. So there you go. <laughs> if you were experiencing issues, Here's what I want to know. We don't have that monitor anymore, the CF791. So what I want to know from you, anyone who has that monitor, please do me a favor, get the 17.8.1 drivers, especially if you have Polaris or a non-Vega card available to you, even if it's not your main one, and uh, install them and see if you see flickering. In the previous video, we basically talked about how it's very easy to create the flickering, launch basically any game, Total War or something like that will do it the most get into the range of 48 to 60 FPS with your settings and uh, turn on Ultimate Engine and then observe. You'll see the flickering. It will be very obvious to you. If you don't see that with these drivers and with the Polaris or previous cards, then it looks like it's been resolved at a driver level. If you do see it, then uh, I don't know. <laughs> Blame the display. 
So, yeah, that's interesting. But the next thing is in the game news front that's related to hardware. This is uh, Final Fantasy XV has a Windows Edition release coming up, and uh, they've posted some recommended specs, mostly for 4K gaming. But uh, this was something we saw at the GTX 1080 Ti event, probably in March. And uh, they were talking about, they brought in, NVIDIA brought in some of the Final Fantasy folks to show off grass simulation, uh, hair work stuff, and some other technologies. And it looks like it's finally coming out in an actual PC version rather than just a tech test, as they called it then. So as for the game, this was shown at Gamescom. It's a Square Enix title, and it's got all the DLC and updates with the core game coming to PC in early 2018. It's being developed on the newest version of the Luminous engine, and it should see partnership with NVIDIA for their proprietary GameWorks functions, AirWorks, TurfWorks, Flow, things like that. And here's the recommended specs. So, quite steep, but there's a reason for it. And so it turns out that when Square Enix contacted Kotaku, Hajime Tabata said, that was a mistake, actually. That was a communications mistake. Something got put in a memo that shouldn't have. What that is, and that's the specifications that went out to press, is based on the specs that we're running the demo on today at Gamescom. We can say now that Final Fantasy XV on PC supports native 4K and also up to 8K, as well as HDR10, but we haven't really revealed anything like minimum specs yet because we're developing at such a high end, which means we can't really define it with the current standards now. At some point, we will publish the recommended and minimum specs, but we can't say exactly what they are at the moment. So those specs that went out were a communications mistake by Square Enix. It probably won't require a 1080 Ti or 170 gigabytes of storage, but we'll see. It was just for the demo systems at the show floor and the booth. And along with the Square Enix stuff, there's also a Destiny 2 news item to look through. So the PC version is officially going to support 4K resolutions. Big deal. It's a resolution that's kind of easy at this point. Uh, we'll have uncapped frame rates on PC, so that's good. Ultra-wide support, kind of interesting, 21 by 9 supported. And uh, they also are saying Destiny 2 will have a full suite of adjustable graphics settings. That was shown at Gamescom with some kind of SLI support included as well. So that's really all there is to say about that one. But Destiny 2 comes out in the immediate future for PC. Once again, like we've done for the last few weeks now, EK has got stuff to talk about. So EKWB has an X299 monoblock coming out. And the newest one is aimed at the Gigabyte X299 motherboards. There are five of them it'll work with explicitly. Supposed to ship this week. Machine from Acrylic and offers a redesigned cold plate to offer more mechanical support for Intel X series CPUs. The pricing on the pre order for the EKFBGA X299 is $137. Supposed to ship August 25th. And it has an integrated RGB strip. Also in liquid cooling news, Alpha Cool's got the Ice Wolf 120 GPX Pro, which will begin shipping as an AIO solution for Vega 64 cards. So the Ice Wolf 120 GPX Pro combines both a water block and an all in one or closed loop cooler with a copper radiator. The base model offers a 120 radiator, but there's also a 240 option. And the new CLC is also compatible with Alpha Cool's existing Ice Bear expandable cooling solution, which we tested previously. Didn't like it a whole lot, to be honest, but. Uh, we did test it and it did in fact move liquid through the loop but you can find our coverage on that for the uh i think it may have was it called the ice wolf i think it was called the ice wolf the liquid cooling block for the video card pre-filled that we hooked up to the ice bear and speaking of the ice bear they have a new 420 ice bear closed loop liquid cooler which is one of the bigger ones on the market if not the biggest closed loop solution we've seen alpha cool is supposed to be offering the 420 with a pure copper radiator supposed to be refillable and expandable as to include GPUs in the loop. And the Ice Wolf GPX Pro Kit should also be compatible. Pricing is about $153 for the Ice Bear 420. Quick one here on cases. The Leon Lee PC Q39 is finally making some moves. So this is the new mini ITX case with liquid cooling in mind from Leon Lee. It's a small form factor case and it uses a cube shaped design with the Leon Lee chambered approach. So it's kind of compartmentalized with the chamber behind the tray supporting installation of pumps and reservoirs, then in front of the motherboard tray being everything else as normally. The rest of it is grommets for routing tubes and cables between chambers. And then there's some room for radiators up to 240 millimeters with the usual case amenities. USB 3.1 Type-C is kind of new 
Uh, pricing on that is supposed to be $210. Now this one was shown at Computex. The Thermaltake View 71 is a full tower case that's got tempered glass on all sides. Side panel offers a combination of thumb screws and hinges for easy access. And the chassis supports motherboards up to EATX, GPUs up to 410 millimeters, CPU heat sinks up to 190 millimeters, and it's got support for fans and radiators aplenty as well because, well, that's what Thermaltake mostly makes. So nine fan locations, radiator support up to 420 millimeters, pricing and availability TBD. The last announcement is the Asus ROG Strix XG27VQ monitor. I think we cut off some letters there to make it easier on me. But that's coming out uh, soon, I guess. So we're keeping an eye on this one. I don't know that we're going to review it or anything like that, but it's worth keeping an eye on. So this is a 16 by 9 monitor, 1800R curve, if you like that, and uh, 144 hertz refresh, a, a, a paltry 10P, 1080p resolution with uh, FreeSync via HDMI or DP. And then they've also got an RGB circle in the back and uh, logo on the back that you'll never see after you put the monitor on a desk. And then also a little RGB logo emitter in case you want the Asus ROG logo in the middle of your desk in front of your keyboard all the time for eternity. So that's what's coming out. I don't, do we have a price on that? $350. So it looks like an actually okay display uh, if a bit... If, if a bit excited on the RGB stuff. But that's it for this time. As always, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And you can subscribe for more coming out this week. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.